What is up heroes, this is Midnight Zero and welcome back to Let's Play Professor Layton in the Curious Village Blind. In the last episode, we started to investigate, uh, I guess more dedicatedly, the Golden Apple rather than the murder, and found ourselves looking in the journal of the late Baron, who mentioned that he had given a note to a close friend who, well, well, that he believes will lead to the Golden Apple, so, hello doggo, Robo Pupper, um, Okay, so we've already chatted with all of our friends here. So I guess we'll continue moving on. Is there something to do with you, Robo Pupper? <laughs> I, um, I don't know. I don't think so. Either way, we are on our way to talk to Ingrid, who has already, <laughs> I guess, lightened our workload and come to us. So, Ingrid, what have you to say? <laughs> Such an odd way of saying that. Oh, look who it is. Professor Ladle, was it? <laughs> the name's Layton, madam. Oh, that's right. Professor Layton. All that talking about the mansion we did last time got me reminiscing. So I decided to stop by for a visit. But enough about me. By the look on your face, it seems that you have something you want to ask me. As a matter of fact, I do. Do you happen to know who Baron Reinhold considered his close friends? His friends, you say? Well... He wasn't exactly what you'd call a social butterfly. I'm sorry, that's really all I knew of his friends. Oh, wait a moment. I do believe I saw that Zepone fellow pay a visit to the mansion a few times. Professor, could she be referring to that man we met? Ah, yes, that gentleman with the fancy little mustache. We should ask if he knows anything. I would wager he's still hanging about the fork in the road just beyond the clock tower. Much appreciated. Thank you for the, the reminder, Leighton. <laughs> so, we'll head back towards the clock tower. Any new puzzles or anything of the light along the way? Of course, we'll click around and see. Marco, do you have anything for us? Lady Dahlia sure is gorgeous. Okay, this is the same thing he had mentioned before. So, we'll continue onward. I don't think we'll find anything new in the general store there. Do you have a puzzle for us? Nothing good can be said about that tower. I heard it's all sorts of scary. You should stay away, yep. Okay. Well, that's that's fair enough. How about in here? Our friend here with all the documents. Since you've come to the town hall, I strongly advise you to follow town procedure. <laughs> follow town procedure and solve this puzzle. <laughs> it's a procedure of the town. Odd equations. Okay. Oh my, it looks like someone has been writing nonsense on the blackboard again. It turns out, though, that under certain conditions, these strange equations are actually correct. Okay, 8 minus 6 equals 2. 8 plus 6 also equals 2. Assuming the above to be true, what does 7 plus 6 equal? I feel like the answer is going to be 1, because um, it's probably some, like, mod thing. <laughs> um... But I don't know 100%. Let's take a look. 8 plus 6 is equal to 2, and 8 minus 6 is equal to 2. Obviously, 8 minus 6 is 2, which would equal 2. Um, what's interesting is 8 plus 6 is equal to 2, right? 8 plus 6, typically, base 10 would be 14, or the decimal system would be 14, right? Uh, if, it were, if we were talking in base 12, though, um, then it would be equivalent to 2, or congruent to 2. I don't know if equals would be the best word there, or best thing to use there, but 8 plus 6 would be 13. If it were base 12, um, that would be 1. Or not base 12, mod mod 12. Um, that would be 1. For those... I, I feel like going to the point of modular arithmetic, while most people get some exposure to it during high school, is not something the game would expect, especially at the level of 30 picarets. So let's see here, is there anything more we could look into? Hmm. Because what's interesting is it says these equations under certain conditions are actually correct. And I feel like that that means there's like, oh, there's something more that's, you know, not written about these equations. So I feel like it would be it would be one, because it would be basically mod twelve. Um 
for those that aren't familiar with modular arithmetic, I don't have a great explanation for you that I can give in a minute or two on a YouTube video, but it's worth looking up. You basically, uh, you basically limit the number of, like, outputs you can get from doing some sort of operation uh, to anything below that whatever n modular number you choose. Um, or basically you take, you do some operation and then you subtract the highest multiple of that number from that result and that's your end um, product. It's way oversimplified and doesn't do it justice, but that's the gist of it. So I think that's what they're going for here. And I can't really think of much else. But again, I still think that would be a bit too much for Professor Layton. <laughs> I really do. I think that's the best thing I have, though, so I'm going to try it. But I mean, at the very least, answer. even without considering modular arithmetic, you could say 7 plus 6 is going to be 1 less than 8 plus 6, which was equal to 2. So, I don't know. <laughs> That's really funny, because technically the the clock, when you consider between 0 at midnight all the way up to 12 p.m., is basically mod 12 as well. That's hilarious. You are correct. This puzzle is using time as a framework for the calculations. If you take 6 hours away from 8 a.m., the time becomes 2 a.m., move forward, etc. That's hilarious. <laughs> okay, so it was too much to consider modular arithmetic. Thank you. That will do nicely. Now please vacate the premises. Wow, already getting kicked out, are we? But, sir, we have to investigate your room to see if there are any more puzzles to solve. And it doesn't seem there are. Alright. Out we go. Um, so, they were telling us... Oh, hello, doggo. Um, oh, you know what? I was saying... I was thinking maybe it's showing where there are hint coins. Maybe that's what they're trying to do with that. Let's see if Layton stops us. He hasn't stopped us. Okay, so we're going to continue going over here. And, um... All uh, right, well, maybe I'm not... Okay, there's a coin there. Interesting. So I think that might be the function, actually, which is really neat. Um, yeah, we'll continue exploring around the town, obviously exploring every nook and cranny we can before we progress the plot. So my apologies to those of you who are really looking forward to that conversation with Zafone. Oh, this time I've really had it. I thought of this great puzzle, but I couldn't find anyone to tell it to. Oh, I'm sorry, Polly, but I'm glad I'm here to, to save you from your frustration. A tile square. Okay. You have at your disposal a large number of tiles like the one shown below. If you were to take these tiles and try to make a square, what is the fewest number of tiles you would need? This sounds similar to a, uh... Oh, what's it called? Um... <clears throat> oh, this is actually, this is actually really clever, because it's not just an extension, right? Um, you can't just do multiples of the tile in the same orientation in multiple directions, because you'll end up with a rectangle rather than a square, right? So you'll basically need to alternate, so a 10-inch side is connected to a 12-inch side, etc. <clears throat> and if that's the case, you only need four. Yeah, I think that would only be four, so you'd have like a 10 side, and then a 12 side, and then you would also obviously then have a 10 side, and then I should label these. So this is like 10, this would be a 12 here, and then this would be 10, because again, um, okay, the, the borders of the screen are being weird, but that's okay. And then this side would be 12 as well, okay touchscreen difficulties, <laughs> um, just due to the orientation of the, the tiles. Um, they, they alternate like that. So then we would have 12 here. I should just write on top. And then we could go up here. This would be 10. And then this would be 12. And this would be 10. And uh, that would obviously, this is <clears throat> asterisk, not drawn to scale, but that would be four tiles. So I think that's actually the minimum you need. Um, so you'd have a square with side length of 22. 
assuming the tiles themselves are rectangles, and I think we can assume that from the diagram they show. So, yeah, so let's do four. I feel pretty confident about that. Oh, I need more water. My answer. Not correct. Frankly, I'm ashamed. Okay. I guess I, uh... <clears throat> I guess I didn't see what they were going for. I thought it was pretty insightful, though. <laughs> um, you have at your disposal a large number of tiles like the one shown below. If you were to take these tiles and try to make a square, what is the fewest number of tiles you would need? Are we allowed to manipulate the tiles at all? For example, if I were to shave one of the tiles? Um, such that the 12 inch side is 10 inch side, I could do it with one, right? Um, I mean, I feel like the depth here is, is not irrelevant. Wow, um... Interesting. So it's not four. I thought I was I thought I was on to them. <laughs> I thought I was I thought I'd figured it out with that. And that would be a twenty-two inch side thing. Um How could I make a square? with less than four. The the little clue they said when I got it wrong was try approaching it from a different angle. So the depth and all that is gonna matter. But even then, if I were to try to like, I don't know, put the tiles on their side so that they're like facing up and I looked at it from like a bird's eye view or something like that, <laughs> um, I would still need four tiles. So there's gotta be something else I'm missing. Worth 30 picarats. So. Can't be that excessive. Granted, I've had a lot of difficulty with the 20 and 10 picarat puzzles. Probably more so than the 40 and 50 ones. So. But 4 was not correct. Hmm. I'm not seeing it, guys. <laughs> I'm not seeing it. I'm trying to think just in general, like what if you were to like stack them on top of each other and then look from like a bird's eye view? But even then, I feel like you would still need four. Unless... Mm, no, even then. Yeah, hmm. I feel like the depth given there is not irrelevant. <laughs> and so I'm trying to think maybe some sort of like 3D uh, object if you were to arrange the tiles in such a way um, that you could make a square when looked at from a different perspective, right? The thing is, even if even if you were to say, lay one tile flat, and then you were going to stack two tiles on their side so that they're, well, the, the 0.5 inches is making contact with the ground, um, and then added that onto the, 
side that measures 12 inches in length such that you're extending the side length of the 10 inch side so that you can make like a 12 inch by 12 inch square. If you were to look at it from a bird's eye perspective, you would still need four tiles in addition to the one laying flat. So that would be five. I don't know. I thought four was good. <laughs> I thought four was the answer. Maybe this is one I sit and think about for a bit and and spare you guys the, the boredom. <laughs> Unless I have some new idea. So, the only other idea I can think of <clears throat> is if you were to try to make a square in the sense of... Alright, we gotta, we gotta get creative now. So imagine you are like looking from the perspective of the ground, not from the ground, but lying on the ground, looking horizontally. And while looking horizontally, you stack, not stack, but you place two tiles such that they're kind of standing up off of the ground. So there's the half inch wide base on the ground, and then there's like a 10 inch tall part. And you have two of them standing there and then you take a another tile and you put it across the two tiles that are standing up such that the two tiles standing up have a height of 10 inches and the width of the tile that is facing you looking at the the ground is um or looking you know from the perspective lying on the ground is also 10 inches and in doing so you have used three tiles to make a 10 by 10 by 10 square. You could also do 12 by 12 by 12 if you wanted. Um, it's really tough to describe, but I guess basically if this were the ground and you were to take one tile and put it so that the 10 inch side is like this and the 0.5 inch or whatever is on the ground and then you took another one and stacked it like that not stacked it, but placed it like that and then placed another tile on top such that this length that's facing you here would be the 10 inch side, then this would be a square. And you've made a 10 by 10 by 10 square with only three tiles. I think that's the only other way I can think of. I wanna try that. They did say to think about it from a different angle. That should do it. So I'm somewhat optimistic, but that's not it either. Ah, uh, I suppose I thought wrong. Okay, um... I thought I'm getting really creative here. <laughs> I'm thinking I'm getting really creative. But I guess not. <clears throat> Alright, so the only other thing that I can think of... The only other thing that I can think of is if you were to, say, have the ground here. Nice flat ground. <laughs> and you were to stack... So let's say we have a tile like this, right? Where the side... Oh man, actually, so let's say you're looking at a tile like this. That's kind of like up on the ground, or, you know, standing up off of the ground. And this side length here is the 12 inches, this is the 10 inch. If you were to start to tilt that tile away from you, this length here would decrease steadily. So, theoretically, if you were lying on the ground looking at it, <laughs> you could tilt this tile back and have it propped up against another tile so, if we were to look at it from the side, it would be something like like this, where that's one tile and this is the other tile. But if you were looking at it from this perspective, you would have it so that the length across the top is 10, and the perceived length of the side of the square will have shrunk from 12 to 10. <laughs> I feel like that's kind of ridiculous. Um, for them to, I feel like that's a little bit too outlandish of a way for them to consider that, oh, you've made a square. But 
but that's the only way I can think of it. So we'll try two, and if this doesn't work, we'll we'll go with a hint. But I thought I had a pretty reasonable four, and then like a okay, it's a little bit stretching it, but but feasible three, and now like a you're really stretching it, but but technically possible and probably fits the definition too. So now I'm I'm clearly missing whatever whatever they're trying to get me to see. So we're gonna use a hint. Since the tiles have a different length and width, you'll need to find a number that can be divided by both dimensions. Of course, the puzzle doesn't end there. You'll need to do a little creative thinking in order to find the fewest number of tiles that allow you to form a square. I feel like... I feel like I already did that. Yeah, I feel like I already did that. We're gonna use another hint. Don't forget that the puzzle puzzle also gives you the thickness of the tiles. Yeah, I mean, I, I know that. But I still don't see why it's pertinent. Alright, hint number three, here it comes. As the sides of the tiles are 10 and 12, the smallest common multiple of the two works up to 60. Therefore, you'll need to arrange a 5 by 6 tile square. It's a total of 30 tiles. Simple, right? Too simple, in fact. There's a way to make a square using even fewer tiles. But you can do it in four. I've already demonstrated that. I, uh... I don't know where the thickness of the tiles comes into play. And they're saying you have to do it in fewer than 30 tiles. As in, like, the 5 by 6, right? Like, the least common multiple of those is, is 60. Um, but there's a way to do it even with even fewer. That's what they were saying with that last hint, right? Yeah, I mean, four tiles. <laughs> right? I don't know guys, I feel like, I feel like either they didn't consider that you could make it with four tiles, or did I miss input the four? I don't know. Maybe I'm missing something that makes this not work? Do they not align well in the middle, like the central area here? Like, do they actually not line up effectively? Was that the problem? Because I guess if you had a 12 length side here, this would extend a bit beyond this first tile. Well, tile one, two, three, four. Tiles, tile two will extend a bit beyond tile one. But the thing is, tile 4 will extend beyond tile 3 and kind of make up for that. Tile 3 will extend to the left a little bit more. So maybe that does leave a little bit of a gap in the center? Is that the problem? Do you, do, do you need to do this enough times? such that that gap in the middle is the size of a tile? Is that the case? I feel like that's way beyond what they're aiming for. But also, maybe it's not. Well, I guess we know it's fewer than 30. The thickness. I don't know. I don't know what they're going for here, guys. <laughs> I really don't. That they want me to incorporate the thickness of the tiles and then a certain perspective. And I don't know if they're okay or not with this central area being open. Does it, do they need to be super tight tile fits? Because if it's not the 5x6 arrangement, um, then what is it? 
All I can think of is if you had a tile in the center where it was 10 by 12 and then you needed to have tiles wrapped around it where it was like at this point I mean even with the hints I don't I don't know what they want me to do do they want me to have like some tiles lying flat and then some on their side like this so then we can look at it from like a bird's eye perspective and it forms a square is that what they want me to do i don't know if i want to even go into all of the effort it would take to to work in that regard then because i mean i could set up like a, a 10 by 12 right so we have like the the 12 and then the 10 side here. So what I could do is add on four tiles here to improve, or no, it would be the other way around actually. Um, forget that. <laughs> it would be adding on four tiles here to improve that to a 12 by 12 square. So five, if you look at it from a bird's eye perspective, that would be a 12 by 12 square. I'm gonna go with that, and if that's not it, I'm probably just gonna end up looking it up because whatever they're hoping I see it as, it's not clicking. That's not it. Frankly. All right, well, um, <laughs> I've, I have approached this from very many angles. I've thought about this quite a bit, and Quite frankly, um, we're not clicking. We're not clicking, Leighton. So, let's let's see here. What's the solution? Okay, so I just looked it up, and they wanted the answer of twenty. Basically, if you were to stack them on their side, you could make it so that the base. You could essentially make um, make it so that, I guess, imagine the tiles are standing up on the floor and you're looking at it from a bird's eye perspective. Um, you could stack consecutive tiles next to each other and then from this perspective, you could have the 10 side, the width, be the the side length of the square when you're looking down on it from the bird's eye perspective and then you could continually stack tiles on their side until you develop a another side length of 10 and in order to do that you would have to add well 0.5 inches 20 times in order to get a another side length of 10 from when you're looking down at it from the bird's eye perspective if at the end of the day they wanted you to look at it from a bird's eye perspective and form a square, you can do it in five, um, as I just showed. I don't like it. <laughs> I don't like it, guys. But that's the answer they want, and you'll see a diagram of what they're talking about in just a moment. Every puzzle has an answer. Yeah, so so they want you to stack them. Oops. Well, went beyond that. But they wanted you to stack them like that so that when you look at them from above, they're 10 by 10. But the thing is, if the square needs to be formed in such a way that when you look at it from a bird's eye perspective, it's a square length, then all you need is to form a 12 by 12 square by having one tile lay flat and then adding four tiles onto the, the length of 10, so you have a 12 by 12 when looking at it from the bird's eye perspective. And then, furthermore, if they don't need to fit, you know, tightly, if it's okay if there's like a small gap in the middle, which I suspect there would be, um, you can do an arrangement of four such that you have a, a four tiles laying flat such that there's a 22 by 22 square. So, and then, like I said from the others, uh, if you really want to work with the forming a square, you could, you know, stack two of them 
um, like long side up and then bridge one across them so you have three tiles but looking at them from the side while lying on the ground you form a square with them so I'm not a huge fan of that um, yeah <laughs> yeah oh come on I was I was all ready to tell you the answer and everything but no, you had to go and ruin it by answering before I said it was okay, didn't you? Ah, yes, of course. Have you ever considered the strong possibility that you might be a jerk? So there goes one that, even with hints, I was not solving. Um, because quite frankly, I think I had better solutions. Um, I guess if, if you guys see where they're coming from, um, or if there was any implication as to what the rules might be that rule out the other solutions I thought of, um, do let me know in the comments. I'd, I'd appreciate that perspective. But anyways, who are you looking for this time? Want to rest for a minute and solve this puzzle? Of course. Of course I do. Which job for 20 picarats? Two corporations have put out help wanted ads. Aside from the information below, the two companies' offers are exactly the same. From a purely financial standpoint, which one should you work for? Company A will pay you $100,000 a year and give you a $20,000 raise yearly. <clears throat> Company B will pay you $50,000 every six months and give you a $5,000 raise every six months. Okay, do we know how long we're working? <clears throat> do, do we know... <laughs> do we know how long we're working for them? <clears throat> I don't, I don't think so, right? I feel like it matters, but... Um, <clears throat> I guess... It's not like a like an interest of sort, right? Like the the amount your raise increases isn't based off of you know the the base salary you get. I mean, the tempting answer is A. the The cynic in me thinks that they're setting it up like A is the obvious answer, so it's probably B. But but realistically speaking, I mean, after a year, you'll get paid a hundred thousand dollars a year. And then they'll raise your pay to $120,000 a year. In Company B, you'll still get... Well... Is the $5,000 raise on the $50,000? If so, I mean, you get $50,000 in that first six months, and then they raise you to $55,000. So at the end of a year, you have $105,000. I mean, either way you look at it, you're still only getting $10,000 in, in a raise every year, whereas with Company A, you're getting $20,000 in a raise. So, I don't see Company B ever overtaking it. Just like quickly thinking about it, right? After that first year, you'll be at 105,000 for B, you'll be at 100,000 uh, for A. After a second year, you'll be at 220,000 for A. And how much will you be at for B? So you'll have already reached that $55,000 um, period. So you will get 50,000, then 55,000, then you would get $60,000 for the first half of the second year. And then you would get $65,000 for the second half of the year. Which puts you at 125000 Plus, of course, the 105000 from earlier. So a total of 230000 Why am I not seeing this? I feel like this should be like a relatively simple, here's the, here's the slope and, you know, all that type of perspective. But it seems like Company B is actually increasing at a rate higher than that of Company A.
Can I write? No, I can't. Yeah, I mean, I guess just like looking at some of the values, right? We said for for A, it'll be 100,000 and then it'll be 120,000 after the second year. For um, for B, after the first year, it'll be 105,000. And then after the second year, you'll get a raise, so it'll be 60,000, and then 65,000, so it'll be 125,000. So I guess you're technically always 5K ahead. Which is so weird because for some reason it's like it seems counterintuitive like I'm not seeing it <laughs> I'm not seeing it but I mean after the third year right you would have 140k and with a and then you would have 70 and then 75k with B so you would still be ahead for some reason it seems so counterintuitive but I mean we'll go with B because that should do it. That's what the numbers are telling me. But <laughs> I guess I'm just shocked by how counterintuitive it seems to me. Yeah. Yeah, that's so weird. <laughs> that's so weird. Cuz like I'm I'm I consider myself very mathematically inclined, but when I first looked at that, I was like, "Oh, shouldn't this be obvious?" But it it wasn't I was trying to kind of like graph it out in my head, but but the numbers just didn't look like like they were matching up with what I was seeing in my head. So weird. But regardless, um, you know Lady Dahlia, right? She's planning to keep the fortune to herself once it's found, and you've been helping her all along. Don't you feel so dumb? Tee hee. Interesting. All right, we'll give Layton the plant for now, and I guess we'll head over to the park, maybe. Is there a coin up here? There is. Ah, so that's that's the purpose there. Let's head inside this um, restaurant and see if there's anything going on in here that we can help out with or, or butt into, rather. Also, because I spent a while on that very first puzzle, I, I've kind of lost track of how long this episode actually is currently. <laughs> I don't know how long this is going to be because I didn't keep track of how long I was planning on cutting out. Regardless, hey you two, you guys like chess, right? How about it? Want to sit down for a game? I'm down. I, I like playing chess. I haven't played in very, uh, very long time, but I did enjoy. In chess, the queen can move the full length of the board diagonally, vertically, and horizontally. See if you can place four queens on this 4x4 chessboard. There's a catch, though. You must arrange the pieces so that no queen blocks another's line of movement. Gotcha. Um, so the first thing we're going to want to do is place one queen in... Um, the corner. Actually, we're probably going to want to do this. Actually, no, we'll stick with the corner for now. If we were to do that, we then only leave one of two spots, either this spot or this spot in this row. Um, so we'll, we'll go with this one for now. However, that then would com well, either of these would completely only this spot would not eliminate all the spots in the third row, right? So whichever row you put in, you completely annihilate all of those <laughs> spots in the row. But it's all about considering the diagonals, right? So this top right one, it gets rid of this spot and this spot. So we have this spot and this spot to choose from. However, if we look at the third row, the far right brown tile is already rendered useless. This left white one will be no matter what. Same with this left brown one. So we need to put this uh, queen on the left brown tile of the second row in order to keep this third row right white tile open. And in doing so, we have messed up. <laughs> so we know that then um, we can't put a queen in the in the corner because of their because it's relatively symmetrical, we can't put it in the corner. Um, which means this queen needs to belong in one of these spots. Which means this has to go here. Which means that this has to go here. And then this has to go here. And that seems right. Um, and just to check really quickly, I think... Yeah, I think we're good. 
Cool. Luke, here's my answer. Here's my answer. Another puzzle solved. 2018. <laughs> Nicely played, chess queen's problem like this. Like this one, I've been around for over a century. Oh, that's a pretty cool puzzle. Very nice. You two are no amateurs, I see. Don't worry, next time I'll have an even harder puzzle for you. Oh, cool. We'll give Leighton the chair. Wow, their room hasn't filled up yet. We'll tend to it eventually. <laughs> Let's see what you have to say for us. Any puzzles on your end? Mr. Crouton. Good day, fellows. Did you ever track down Raymond? Indeed we did. Thank you for your assistance in the matter. Good to hear. Well, since you're here already, why not take a load off and rest for a bit? What's this? Oh my, where did I put that measuring cup? Ah, yes, another one of the measuring cups. Is something the matter? I have 16 quarts of water that I want to divide in equal portions of 8. The problem is my measuring cup seems to have grown feet. Can you think of a way I could use these 7 and 9 quart pitchers to divide things up? Of course. Of course, I'd be happy to help, Crouton. 60! 60 pick rats? Oh boy! Alright, let's uh... Let's get to work. So the first thing we're going to do is uh, break up the 16 into a set of 9 and 7. Then we'll take the 9, put in the 7 so that we have 2, and then um, 7 and a 7. A good general principle for these is to try to create new numbers and never redo the same move you just did. So we just took the 9 and put it into the 7, so we are not going to take the 7 and put it back into the 2. Um, we're also not going to put the uh, the 2 back into the 7, because then we kind of recreate the 9-7 state, which we could have done just with our very first move. So that tells us our move is going to be to put the 7 there. So we have a 14, a 2, and a 0. Now again, we're not going to redo the move we just did, right? So we're not going to take the 14 and pour it back in the 7. And we're also not going to put the 14 and pour it in the 2, because that will bring us back to our original state that we could have created, like, or it would actually bring us back to the very first move we did. So that actually rules out all of those moves, and instead we're going to take the 2 and put it into this cup. Now what? Well, we're not going to take the 2 and put it back in the 0. We're not going to put the 2 back in the 14, um, because that would bring us back to our original state. So instead, we are going to have to move the 14. And we're going to have to choose, do we want to put it into the 9 quart or the 7 quart? Well, if we put it in the 7 quart glass, we'll be back to our original state of 9 and 7, meaning something we could have done from our very first turn. So we have to move the 14 to the 0. And now we have 5, 9, and 2, right? So what do we do at this point? Well, we're not going to take the, the 2 and put it in the 5, I believe. <laughs> um, we're not going to take the 2 and put in the 5 because then we'll end up with a 7-9 which is again something a state we could have created from our very first move. Um, similarly we're not going to put the 5 in the 2 uh, for the same reason. So in order to create some new numbers basically um, because we can't pour the 2 into the 9 we're going to take the 9 and pour it into the 2. And now we have 7, 5, and 4. Um, some relatively interesting numbers. So what are we going to want to do here? Well, we're not going to put the 7 back into the 4, because that will just undo what we've already done. Um, we're not going to put the 4 into the 5, or the 5 into the 4. Um, we need to choose where to put the 7, and again, um, we're not going to undo what we just did. So we're probably going to put the 7 into the 5. So now that we have a 12, a 4, and a 0, now, we're not going to, well, we could technically un undo that. Um, we're not going to put the 12 into the 4, because that will just create a 9 and 7. Um, we can't, obviously, take the 7 quart and pour it into anything. Um, we're not going to put the 4 into the 12, so we need to choose where to put the 12. If we put the 12 back into the, the 7, we create the 7 and the 5, which is just what we did. So I think what we need to do is actually take the 4 and put it into the 0 here. And that'll give us a little bit of freedom to make different types of numbers. Um, yeah. So 
what are we going to want to do here? Now I think we're going to want to... If we pour the, the 12 into the 4, we'll end up with a 7-9 state, which is counterproductive. So I think we're going to want to pour the 12 into the, the 0 here and create a 9, a 3, and a 4. And then the only thing that avoids redoing the same move or a 7-9 state is pouring the 9 into the 4. Now we have a 3, 6, and 7. I believe we're getting close uh, because we're creating new numbers, as you can see. <laughs> um, so... In order to avoid a state we've already been at, I think we need to pour the 7 into the 3, so we have 10. And now what? <laughs> and now what? We have a 10 and a 6. We just poured the 7 quart into the 16 quart, right? So we're not going to redo that by pouring the 10 back into the 7 quart and forming a, a 3 and a 7 again. We're also not going to pour the 6 into the 10. What happens if we pour the 10 into the 6? Well, we end up with a 7-9 state, so that's not helpful. So I think what we're going to want to do then is take the 6 and pour it into the 7. And then... And then we take the 10 and pour it into the 9. Ah, yes, that's the final. Yeah, so now we're there. So now we take the 9 and we pour it into the 6. We have 8 and a 7. We take the 7 and put it back over here. And ta-da! We Luke have done it! My answer. So I'm generally speaking, solved. that's a good strategy, is to seek out new numbers and new combinations. Avoid returning to states that you could have created earlier on. So notice every single time I was saying, I shouldn't do this move because it will take me back to a 7-9 split, which is something I could have done for my very first move. And I never wanted to redo the move that I just did. Um, and that was a really good guide throughout the entirety of that. But 15 moves, nice. So we got that done. Ah, genius, now that you've done it for me, it all makes sense. I wish I had someone like you in the kitchen. Oh, I meant to mention this earlier. I heard a rumor that the kidnapper lives in that tower. You know, I've never heard anyone say anything good about that tower. <laughs> Make sure you keep clear of it, okay? Oh, we got a flower bouquet. Luke, you look like you could use some uh, flowers. Maybe uh, improve the scent of that young boy room. <laughs> um, okay, so that was that was pretty cool. Um, can we head over to the park? I also have no idea how long this episode has been going on. It's probably too long at this point, but huh, it's still locked shut. Just when will this place open? I wouldn't get your hopes up. The gate's covered in dust. I don't think anyone's been here for a long time. Okay, anything new on the, the ground that we can interact with? No? Sign? No? This sign? Oh! Maybe. Still locked shut. Oh. It's not a puzzle. It's a... Dialogue. I'm shocked. Okay, so I think that covers this area pretty well. So I think we're actually ready to to head into... Actually, since Chapter 5 technically started... Oh, okay, I was going to say, they may have added bottles from Chapter 4 that we missed. And I thought that we had gotten through all of them. So far, I guess the only solution, or the only puzzle I didn't solve was that tile one. Um, I've had to use hints on other ones, but eventually got them. Oh, why thank you, doggo. <laughs> um, that's really helpful. It keeps me from just randomly clicking around. But yeah, so far, that tile one was the only one that I've really... Uh, actually, maybe, do I remember the other ones? I guess, yeah, I think that's the only one I've looked up. Right? I don't remember from earlier, I don't think so. So, I... I that's the only one that I've really been like, okay, I don't think that's an effective solution, or the instructions weren't quite clear enough, or given the constraints or how things are described, I think I could come up with a solution that's different from the uh, the game's proposed one, but that's that's okay. Um, I don't know how long this episode's been going on. We're gonna, we're gonna see what this cat has to say and see if we can do one more puzzle, squeeze it in there. That cat and mouse seem to get along pretty well, don't they? Do you think so, Luke? I would have guessed the cat was tormenting that poor mouse, but if you say the two of them are friendly, I believe you. Of course, it has to do with animals. 
<laughs> Leave it to me. By the way, Professor, have you heard this one before? Oh, stellar transition, Luke. Stellar. What's E? Huh? 50 picarets. What did I get myself into, guys? <laughs> they need water. Um, according to the diagram shown here, A is 2, B is 3, C is 3, D is 4. D is 4, huh? Makes me think E would be 4 as well, but I don't know. Um, the first, at first glance, it makes it seem like it's the number of sides uh, it's interacting with. I guess like on the inside of the uh, image. So that would be like one and two for A, and then B would be one and then two and then three, and then C similarly would be one, two, and three. D, however, being four doesn't fit that. D would be three by that mechanism. However, I think I think the solution may just be that it's the number of shapes that the sides of the labeled region come into contact with. So A, for example, is this region here, and each side comes into contact with this region and this region, meaning A would be two. Now B, similarly, when we draw the sides, this side up here meets this region, this one meets this one, and this one meets this one, so that would be three. C, similarly, has one region, like all the other shapes, has one side corresponding to one shape. This one, this one, and this one. So C would be three. Now when we look at D, it only has three sides, but one of those sides is adjoined to two different shapes. This one here, and this shape here, both adjoined with this left side of D. This region here adjoins to that top one, and then this one adjoins to that one. So that's why I think D is four. So when we look at E, we draw its boundaries and we see how many shapes is it adjoined to. On the top, there's one, there's two, there's three, there's four, and there's five. So I think it would be five because it has four sides. Three of those sides are one to one with some other shape. And then on one of those sides, it's actually got two shapes that it's joined to. So I think, I think E is five here. Or at the very least, if it's not five, I don't know. Um, this seems like a pretty legitimate pattern or underlying mechanism for determining what each letter uh, represents numerically. Yeah, I think so. So I'm, I'm gonna go with that for now, five. Let's see how it goes. Look, here's my answer. All right. Another so that went surprisingly quickly for a 50 pick grab puzzle. Well done. The number assigned is... Okay, the number of sections that are touching the labeled section. Gotcha. Gosh, I was sure I'd come up with a really good puzzle, but it was still too easy, I guess. Okay, and on that note, I think we'll say we'll continue solving puzzles, continue our route to Zapode with whatever distractions we find along the way in the next episode. I hope you guys enjoyed this one. Hope you guys weren't too frustrated with my my uh, attempts at the tile square puzzle. Um, like, I mean, I've already given everything I have to say about that puzzle, so let me know if you have any thoughts regarding it as well, or um, whether you agree or disagree in the comment section below. And I hope you enjoyed the other ones as well. It was really fun doing the measuring cup one. I feel like I, I feel like the, I don't know, I guess you could call it an algorithm. Um, but for solving those, the general rule of thumb is, is really helpful. So it was pretty cool putting it to the test in what was a 60 picker app puzzle, which is pretty crazy. And yeah, um, again, apologies to those of you looking for a lot more plot advancement. I'm definitely taking my time seeking out all puzzles I can along the way, so thank you for your patience. But until the next episode, this is Moon Knight Zero, and this mission is complete.